I am in Kuo and I'm right here at the Rock City Hotel. There's no other place to be in Ghana than in Rock City. And I'm waiting for my sister June Sarpon, OBE, to take her around so that she can experience Kuo for the first time. Yes, it's her first time in Kuo and I had to bring her here. Rock City. The Rock City. I've heard so much. In Easter, yes. there's nowhere else to be but in Quo. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's like the best place to be. Party, hey. different events. Okay. So we're going to have a ball. Are you yes, ready? I'm ready. You're prepared? I'm prepared. For late nights? Late nights. Yes? yes. Okay, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> My first stop with June Sarpon was at the launch of the Abitifi Stone Age Community Development Park, which was graced by His Excellency Nanado. The Stone Age Park has sought to restore and revive the lifestyle of the activities of the inhabitants of the Abitifi Caves 12,500 years ago. The paramount chief of the third, I don't think of Kwa, traditional area, and the chief of Abitifi. Our revered queen mothers, chiefs and traditional authorities, ladies and gentlemen, let me add my voice in welcoming you to Abitifi and especially the Stone Age grounds. I'm overwhelmed with joy and feel extremely honored with your massive turnout and also for the fact that finally the vision that started so many years ago but seemed far-fetched has eventually materialized. Today, by the grace of God, the Stone Age Park is being commissioned. <laughs> We're here. I'm with my big sister. She doesn't like me calling her big sister, but she is my big sister. I don't sister. mind. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm good, thank you. <laughs> and she has been an inspiration for many years. And I say that because I remember watching her on Channel 4. And when they say representation matters, it truly matters. And I think for me, that's when presenting, and just being able to speak 
on TV and radio. I got all my confidence from you, June. Yeah, honestly, I haven't told you this before, but honestly, and I was like, she's gone in. Her name is Sarp on June. We are in Quo Quo. Quo. You can't be anywhere but in Quo for Easter. And so I wanted you to experience it. We're going to go paragliding. We're going to go to the waterfalls yes. to see the lakes as yes. well. I hear the president's coming. And the well. president is coming. Yep. You're going to see things we've been doing in Quell. So enjoy. conversation about your journey mm -hmm. and how you feel as a diasporan yes. who is Ghanaian yes. and the opportunities that people can tap into back here on the continent. Of course, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you for having me. Was Channel 4 the beginning for you? No, it wasn't. Okay. Uh, KISS FM was the beginning. Um, I did work experience there when I was 16. When you were 16? Yes, very young. And that changed everything. Everything. So what made you do work experience at Kiss FM? Was it, did you already know that this is what you wanted to go into? You wanted to be speaking, you wanted to be mm. a TV presenter. What made you? Well, I always knew I wanted to be a presenter. So I grew up in East London, obviously Ghanaian parents. Yeah. And when I was 14, I had a terrible car accident. And so I ended up in hospital. While in hospital, I was in hospital for almost a year and I didn't walk. Oh, wow. And while I was there, um, I used to watch a lot of TV because I was in the room by myself. How old were you at that time? 14. 14. And so that's when Oprah Winfrey's show had just started in the UK. And so I saw this amazing black woman doing this job, like this chat show thing. And I thought, oh, my God, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And I was so lucky that I had already put my name down for work experience for Kiss FM. And because I got sick, my placement was deferred for another year and a half and they kept it for me for once really? I yeah so for once I got better so once I got better I then went to do the work experience and I got on so well there that they ended up allowing me to come back in the holidays to work and so I would come and work in the holidays every so often um, and then I went to do my A-levels. I did my A-levels. What did you study? I did government and politics. I did media, media studies, studies, I yeah. think it was called then. I did then. media studies. Uh, and English. And then once I uh, finished, um, I then, or was it performing arts? I can't remember. It's that long ago. It was either English or performing arts. One of the two. I think it was I performing, performing arts, arts, actually. I think it was performing arts. Um, and so then once I finished that, they offered me a job. And the rest is history. Wow. At KISS? Yeah. So you yeah. worked at KISS for how long? I worked at KISS for, I think, five years. Five years. And then while I was at KISS, I mean, you know the way the world works. So you know who Trevor Nelson yeah. is. Those that are in the UK yes. you know who he is. He's a big presenter in the UK. Um, and he was one of our big DJs at KISS at mm -hmm. the time. Huge. And he got a job on MTV doing a show called MTV Lit. Yeah, I remember a big that. big R&B show. Mm -hmm. And so MTV were looking for somebody to present their dance show. 
and he recommended me to them. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he was like, there's this young girl at Kiss FM. She's never done TV before, but she's great on radio. I think you should give her a shot. And so I interviewed, and I, there's a long story about the interview. I almost didn't even go to the audition. Why? So the, what happened? No, I want to know. What so, happened? So basically, so while at Kiss FM, back uh, in the day in the music industry, you would be on the sort of air as a DJ, mm -hmm. but then usually you would have a record company job at the same time. Okay. So I was working at Sony BMG Music. Okay. And so I was part of the team that launched TLC, that oh, wow. launched Usher. I mean, all the big sort of R and B oh, incredible. artists of that day. Right. And so I was working on Usher's first album. Remember the You Make Me Wanna oh, album? Oh, You Make Me Wanna. Yeah, the one I'm with. Start a new relationship with you. This do what you do. So I organized his first ever big showcase wow. for the UK. I was there. Were you? I went to you that show. You were 15. I was yeah. there. <laughs> like, I'm a big Usher fan. Oh, well, well, you snuck out of the house to get there. <laughs> And because I was in the middle of organizing that, I didn't actually get the chance to rehearse the scripts for the audition, which was taking place the next day. So I'd gotten home late from the office and I was absolutely exhausted. And so um, I thought, oh, I'll wake up early and learn the scripts then. So you know what it's like. Yeah, tired. And, oh, and see, I slept and I woke, over up. woke up late. And I was like, I don't know this script. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to mess it up. And luckily, I had a friend from America staying with me. And she was like, oh, yes, you you're, are. You're going. <laughs> and so we jumped, got dressed, jumped on the tube, went to um, MTV, which fortunately wasn't that far from my house. Okay. And um, got there. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I even signed the wrong name in the book. Because I was like, if, if they... If they no, it's me, and I mess up. I might never get a chance, even though they would see me. So yeah. I don't know what my logic was. <laughs> but anyway, so so I signed this wrong name in the book, get into the audition room, and I see all of our big name DJs. Oh, my goodness. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened because when I saw them all, I thought, oh, well, I'm not going to get this. I don't stand a chance. So it meant I wasn't even nervous anymore because I thought, I'm not going to get it. All the nerves just went like this. Went because I thought, I'm not going to get this. So then when it came to the actual audition, they asked for the two longest bits on the script. And I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. So it was so funny. I said a little prayer. Now, during the time when I was very sick in hospital, I became very spiritual, not particularly religious, but very spiritual and a very deep connection to God. And, and that is what got me through those you know, difficult times. And I was like, God, I promise you, I'm so sorry that I have been this disorganized, but if you let me remember these scripts, I will never ever be this disorganized again in my life. And I somehow read the two, somehow remembered them. You remembered? Did it, and it went great. And they were like, you know what you're doing. I think if only you knew. A week later, I got a call offering oh me the job, my. and it changed my life. It, ch it yeah. changed everybody's life, including mine. Like, <laughs> you were so powerful on the screen. It was nice to see a dark skin mm. black woman yeah. on the screen. Yeah. And you represented both for Africa, black people, just everyone. Oh. Honestly, it oh. was like you said how seeing Oprah changed your life yeah. and how, you know, you seeing her, that's the impact that you made on us in the oh, UK and around the world, honestly. But I want to go back a little bit. Mm. You and your family left because of the coup. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a bit about that. How yeah. was your experience in Ghana? Yeah, so we were all born in the UK and the idea was that we would go back to Ghana, my parents would go back to Ghana and sort of be a part of a new Ghana, as it were. And two years in, three years in, the coup happened. And as you know, back then, families that were sort of um, from elite backgrounds yeah. or, or how they were seen back then, or um, families that had a link to the then government, you know, were the worst thing you could be in the country at the time. And we sort of happened to be all of those things. Um, and so, so your dad was in government? Uh, yes, my dad was uh, worked for the Treasury. Worked for the Treasury. And okay. so basically one of my earliest remem memories is with armed militia come into our house. Wow. And we fled. And we literally got on a plane the next day, ended up in the council estate in East London. 
Wow. Mm. What was your dad's name? What's Sam. It? Sam. 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 Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So he worked at the Treasury for a long time? Uh, no, because he was worked in a bank in the UK. for. A, so what was amazing, oh. my dad was actually one of, I think he was the first black bank managers for Prudential in the East London oh, era. Wow. Yeah, area. He did very well, young, even wow. in the UK. Hey, wow. But there was only so far you could you go, go. Yes, of course. Back then, so the idea was to sort of take that to Ghana. Yeah. And so, was there any for you at any point? Was there any dislike for Ghana? Never. At some point, how no? could there be dislike no? for Ghana? Okay. There be. Oh, you mean after that? Yeah, after well, that. Well, I think I'm, we yeah. were too young to know. Okay. Uh, maybe for my parents, though they've never expressed that to us. But I think we were too young to know that there was. No, but for many years we didn't go back. We didn't. Yeah, for a long time we couldn't go back. Do you and know I how remember, many years? Oh, I would say at least six or seven. And so when we were able to go back, that was a big deal. Wow. Yeah, wow. so yeah. Yeah, so tell us about going back well, the go, first time. Going back the first time, I think I must have been about nine or ten. Okay. Um, and luckily my great-grandmother was still alive then. I had the most amazing great-grandmother who lived in Kumasi. And she was an incredible woman who had done very well, um, you know, from a very poor village in Insuta um, and started trading as the market yeah. traders mm -hmm. and became a self-made woman. Wow. Yeah. And so she had this compound uh, in Kumasi, Kwadaso, and all the family had uh, houses on the compound. And so I remember as a kid, when we started going back, all my cousins, everybody would be around. It was wow. quiet. And it's such a shame we've lost that, where we don't do that anymore, that compound yeah. living. I, I really think it's it, there's a reason why for centuries, that is how African people, and actually, if you look at it, that is how everybody, up until recent history, where there became a sort of a focus on the nuclear family in the West, that is how everybody's lived. It takes a village to raise a Absolutely. child. Absolutely. Yeah. So were both your parents from Kumasi? Yes. My mother was from Insuta, Insuta. and my father's Kumasi, Kumasi. main Kumasi. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, Ashanti's. And so, <laughs> like, because speaking to you now, June still speaks Chi yes. very fluently. Yes. How have you been able to maintain? Was it your parents that kind of made sure yeah. that in the house, like my, my parents? Yeah, for sure. I, my mother gets the credit for that. Yeah, yeah and that she spoke to you, but also all my aunts and everybody were around. So she was everywhere. And you know, in East London, you know, you're yeah. from there. There's such a strong Ghanaian community that you didn't lose touch with Ghana growing up in that area. And I'm so grateful for that. Absolutely. Because I have friends who grew up in different parts of the UK and that wasn't their It's true, it's yeah. true. But June, when you told your parents that you're going to be a radio presenter, a mm. TV presenter, mm. how did well, they take that? I mean, that? African parents are all about education. <laughs> yes. And not, what do they call it? Bandsman, uh -huh. not being a bandsman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, it wasn't well received at all. <laughs> At all. What did they say? No, I remember having a family meeting and all of these. Oh my goodness. And I, so there was a family meeting. Family I, I remember meetings, the family meeting. Yeah. yeah, why don't we do them anymore? <laughs> all the aunts will come and say, hey, I don't know who you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, but um, no, it wasn't well received. But the lucky thing was it started picking up pretty quickly. Wow. I was very lucky. Within less than a year, I was on air. Wow. And that changed everything. And that changed everything. Then it became from, hey, June, what will be bad, June? No, no. TV oh, TV is so. <laughs> so what happened to your career after that? You said that was the biggest moment in your career. Mm. What then? Well, turning point. Turning point. Yeah. What happened after? Yeah. So, so after I got the MTV job, I was doing a show called MTV Dance Floor Chart, mm -hmm. where I was, imagine, I was paid to go night clubbing. It's kind, what? Of cool. it's kind of cool when you're 19 yes. you know so i was paid to go night clubbing um and so i did that show for a while then i started doing mtv select with richard black yes i remember that and that show just took off and we became one of the biggest highest rated shows yeah. for, actually for a while the highest rated show on the network wow. um and that's the thing that really sort of then got me known to the mainstream um, MTV audience and then from there I was very fortunate enough to get a show called Planet Pop yeah. on Channel 4 
which used to come on T4, and then they gave me the main T4 yeah, gig. Yeah. yeah. So T4 is the one that really sort of changed everything. It changed everything. Mm. And then you also did some like stuff in the US. That was later. Yeah. yeah. So, so how I, did how, what what made you go into the US? Yeah. As well? So I so I you know I'd done T4 for a good ten years or so and. It was an amazing show and we got to interview the most incredible people in the world and you know we were all so young and I don't think we understood just how lucky we yeah. were. There aren't shows like that anymore. No there isn't. After T4, because in television there's this sort of funny period you have from when you are a youth TV presenter mm -hmm. to then the transition to adulthood and not everybody makes it. Yeah. And I kind of knew that I'd probably, the, the youth thing was kind of about to be done with. I was 30 by that point, wow. or 29. And back then in the UK, sort of the big, I'd done a lot of very big mainstream shows, which had done well, but still the sort of big Saturday night shows that Anton Deck do, yeah. or Davina McCall do, if you're British, you'll know who they are, yeah. um, weren't really available to me. They weren't ready to have a black, black person. person. Not yeah, then. it's true. And so I knew that I probably needed to go and do something else somewhere else. And I also wanted to be scared again as well. I, you know, I got to the mm. point where I wouldn't get scared getting, I was so used to it. So I wanted another challenge. Challenge. Um, and so the holy grail of TV was America. So I moved to the States in 2008, I think it was, yeah. um, the Obama years, yeah. which were amazing to live there. I lived there most of the yeah. Obama years. And even w was there, I helped, I was part of, I did some campaigning for them. And actually, I remember their final rally. Actually, I have a funny story. So, I did some campaigning in Virginia, okay. which was then a Republican district, and they weren't sure if it was going to go blue. And so, we were like, this is one of the toughest ones. So, a bunch of us went there. We were working with the sort of local Virginia office and door knocking. And um, this old man who was in his 90s old white man came and he had a bruised eye and everything and I was like oh my goodness what happened to you and he said I'm a farmer and I stepped on a rake and hit oh. my eye and I went to the hospital but I refused to be checked in because I wanted to come and campaign for Barack Obama oh. because when he was younger he had been a segregationist this man oh. And he felt helping Obama win, win was almost his redemption. Oh. And when I had that conversation with that man, I was like, oh yeah, he's going to win. Oh my goodness. If people like this, yeah. Are, yeah. And so we went to the um, final big sort of um, rally and his grand Obama flew in and his grandmother had died that night. And so it was such a powerful moment. It was just silent. And he, kind of, he said, you know, this is for her. Oh. And we were like, okay. Let's see what happens tomorrow, and, oh it, and it all worked and it, out. Yeah, it all worked out. Yeah, so I was lucky to live there during that time. Um, and um, pretty luckily, I started working quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, started being a pundit on a lot of the sort of political channels. Did some stuff with Larry King. Um, then I started a, another TV show. Um, and then I sort of pivoted. Because this is the beauty of America and the American dream and opportunities. Um, I was at a dinner. I was very good friends with Sarah Brown, mm -hmm. Gordon Brown's yeah. wife. And she was organizing a dinner in New York and she invited me. And so all of the women were challenged to do something for other women. And so myself and a actually fellow Ghanaian of mine, a fellow Ghanaian stood up and we said we were going to do a women's conference. We'd never done one before. And... So we announced it to this women room full of like Barbara Streisand, wow. and Nicole Kidman. And oh are. my goodness. So it meant we had to do, to do it. it. <laughs> so we had like three months. And so we ended up organizing this women's conference called Women Inspiration Enterprise. And it became the market leader in America. And we were one of the first women's conferences. Wow. You know, this is 2010. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, and every power woman you can think of, Melinda Gates, Nancy Pelosi, Iman, wow. Queen Rania. I mean, oh, you my know, oh, everybody. Um, and so it was really good confidence building for me. You know, one of the things I always say is the best thing about moving to America is it built my confidence in ways that perhaps I wouldn't have had I stayed. I needed that time out. And um, and then, you know, I had a lovely run. I lived in America for eight years or so. And then it was kind of time to come back in that I'd been gone 
long enough to be missed, yeah. but not long enough to be forgotten. <laughs> and if I left it any longer, longer. <laughs> I've been in the forgotten territory. <laughs> so is that when you came to do the book? Did the book come first or did the BBC well, the, come first? The book came first. The book yeah. came because um, well, I was filming in America and this young guy appeared on set. And, you know, it's so funny. I had these sort of idea in my head of who I thought he was. And I found myself, even as a working class daughter of immigrant black woman, yeah. being having limiting belief and being somewhat prejudiced against this young guy. Because even though I've been campaigning for my industry to be much more inclusive, I wasn't even used to someone like that in that context. No, no, yeah. So I had to, I didn't even know this is how deep some yeah, of this stuff is. Yeah, sometimes you don't know. Yeah, yeah. That we've even been sort of conditioned ourselves. Yeah. So, so anyway, so that's what made me write the book in that I wanted to create a conversation around how we get true inclusion. And so the book came out in 2017, yeah. pre-Me Too, pre-George Floyd. And back then I was having to make the argument to sort of companies and you know, in people about why diversity is important. Good. Yeah. And then, you know, once George Floyd and obviously before that Me Too happened, it just took off and then you know, companies were coming to me asking me how to do, to do it. it. So that's what, so, so then this other career opened up, unintentionally so, um, and then BBC came yeah. knocking. Yeah. Head of diversity. Global, global creative director of diversity. Wow. So yeah, it was a lot of fun and I did it for three years and we put together a, in, in dollar term, $150 million investment wow. in diverse content. And you know, a lot of that stuff, we had the first year of programs um, and there's another two to go. And I think actually they will end up surpassing the, the amount. Wow. Yeah. But at the time you were still doing like, is it Sky? You're yes. Still doing the, is it yes. The, so the beginning, the, the pledge. Yeah. yeah the at the pledge, beginning, I was still doing the pledge. I have what they call a portfolio career. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I was I was part time with the BBC and still able to do, to do that. Yeah. yeah. So I was still presenting, still advising other companies um, and speaking, Fantastic. a lot of speaking. So what are you doing now? So now actually, I get to write my next book, Yay. which I haven't had the time to do. Um, which I'm very excited Good. about. Um, so Do we my... know the title? Do we know what it's about yet? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's it's an updated version of Diversify okay. with everything that's happened since it since, came out. Oh, fantastic. So, okay. And so much has happened since it came out. And then after that, I have a, a, my book, which will be a memoir called Only One in the Room. Wow. So yeah, but that one would take probably two years to write. Because it's been there's been a lot of moments when you've been the only one in the room, right? My whole as career. Black, as a black yeah, woman. Always. Um, we're trying to change it. And I and I think when time in the BBC hopefully we're able to make some headway. I think so. And then in addition to that, still lots of presenting and public speaking. And then I think the next thing will be business. I think all of the principles that I've been teaching organizations, I'd like to build a company from the ground up based on those inclusive principles. Wow, that's so, amazing. So this is why I'm sort of coming to Ghana, because mm -hmm. I think there's there's an opportunity here, particularly with Ghana in the UK. Yeah. So, yeah. June actually watches a lot of my shows. I watch all your shows. She's watched all my shows. I have, yeah. And I really love it. So you've been seeing what Ghanaians have been doing in yeah. terms of the diaspora that coming are coming back, back home. Yeah. What opportunities do you see as a diaspora when you come back home to Ghana? Well, I think the thing that we have that we probably don't value enough is our culture. You know, even just seeing all the things that we've been seeing while we've been on the way up to Quo, yeah. and then obviously the itinerary that you so have <laughs> generously have planned for me today. Yeah. Um, I just think, wow, there is an opportunity to really market this culture to the world because there's a pride we have in who we are yeah. um, that I think the world needs to see in that we're unapologetically proud of who we are but at the same time probably the most inclusive people you'll ever meet yeah. um, so I think something around our culture uh, definitely uh, is what, what you know if you look at how the art world has exploded and black portraiture particularly Ghanaian black portraiture is perhaps some of the most exciting art around at the moment. I'm wondering what's next. And then when you think of Afro B again, what's next? So yeah, I'm excited. What do you think about our fashion? I think I've, I'm wearing Christy, <laughs> Christy Brown. Brown. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, Ghanaian right now. Yes. I think our fashion is fabulous. Actually, I, I'm on the board of the British the fashion, fashion Council. Yes. And so we're going to be doing, a, in October okay. this year, 2023, we will be doing a big cultural exchange oh, between uh, African fashion, not just Ghanaian fashion, African fashion and the UK. Fantastic. Yeah. I think we need to do more of that. Yeah. Are you on King Charles's... Ambassador um, Prince Charles. Yes, Charles. You're, you're yeah, Princess Charles. Yes, Princess Charles. Yeah, for years. For many years. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, the Princess Charles, I've, yeah, I've been doing that since I was maybe 22. Wow. And, which. <laughs> We're not saying her age, hey, oh, she's still young. We're still Ghanians, we're proud of our age. Uh, <laughs> so how do you know, June? 45. 45. Mm, yeah. And you still look young. <laughs> uh, what did I say? Black That's don't not crack. <laughs> but no, well, now you, the, the kids call me Auntie June, I love it. They call you Auntie June? Yeah, in the UK they call me Auntie June. In Ghana they started calling me Mommy. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what they do. I said, don't call me Mommy, yeah. I'm not your oh, mum. Like, please. No, <laughs> we are the same age group, darling. Oh, don't mommy, call me Mommy. <laughs> How has Quo been for you? Quo has been amazing. And honestly, Denta, thank you so much You're for bringing welcome. me. Because I've never been to this part of the country. Yeah. Obviously, with my family from Kumasi. So, uh, so if I'm in Ghana, I'm even in Accra. Kumasi and then Cape Coast Cape actually Coast, yeah. so I've never done this part of the country and it is magnificent I mean it is so lush so beautiful the greenery and just to see the the warmth of the people here it's extraordinary and to be in this incredible new national park that's been open yep so excited to be here it's, it's such a powerful place and I would recommend anybody come to Kuo. Absolutely. If you come to Ghana, don't just come to Accra. You know, go to Kumasi, see a tomb for. Come here, come to this site, yeah. paragliding, which we'll be doing later. There's so much here. And actually, come during Easter. Yeah. Because it's almost like a, a cultural spring break. It, really, it is. Isn't it, it is. <laughs> Without all the debauchery and drinking that happens elsewhere. Yeah, and the thing is, like, everybody's door is open in Quo. Yeah. Like, literally, you move from house to house, to parties to parties, and everybody welcomes you. You know, you don't feel as if you, you're not home. You're like, an outsider. You're, you're an outsider, even if you're a shanty, whatever. They don't yeah. care. Like, this is this is home. Yes. Um, and and so, everyone knows each other. Everybody does. Everyone knows each other. Everybody knows yeah, each you other. Yeah, you say, I'm going to such and such. Oh, Tiho. Oh, Tiho. Yeah. Oh, Tiho. Yeah. Oh, Fa, oh, Pa, a friend is saying, I'm sorry, Dain, no more. Now, who a papa no ton coconut na if you knew a hono. And then they're right. You take those directions <laughs> and, and you will get there. there. <laughs> but Jun, what's your favorite Ghanaian dish? Oh, Ghanaian food makes me so happy. I know. We know that, June. June, June loves her food. Oh, I love food so much. Like, honestly, you know, when we die, I hope if we have like a choice of one thing you can take from earth to yeah. heaven it's food yeah and it will be jollof it will be jollof yeah mm, it's a jollof really yeah. <laughs> so jollof rice for june yeah and i love cooking so you love cooking as well yeah i love it i love cooking oh, but there aren't many Ghanaians that can't cook oh yeah no, it's such most... a part of our culture absolutely yeah no, absolutely so, so did your mom teach you how to cook yes for sure she was like making yeah. sure that you guys and were in the all kitchen my mom and my aunt some of them are some of the best cooks ever and we were just always around that cooking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, but Ghana, you know, like your, your, even though you speak Chi, your accent is very English. British. Yes. Very yes. British. And my tree sounds British. <laughs> Do you know what? It's so funny because when you're speaking a language, you don't know you have an accent. You know, like when somebody is speaking English and they have a French accent yeah. or whatever accent. I'm like, oh my gosh, I must sound like somebody who's speaking Chi with an accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do they say to you, though, your family members? Well, because I'm still sort of saying, how do you say such and such again? So I'll be like, um, I'll speak the tree and I'll be like, uh, toilet brush. <laughs> Car. <laughs> but I don't laugh at you because a lot of them, they're almost best still, Kakra. They're be almost still. Almost still. Almost still. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Then you've got a good family yeah. because some of them are best still, sir. Oh, Debbie, Debbie. I'm going to say, we have brought for too much. Debbie, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to Oh, 
Well, that's a little time with June Sarpon. She's an inspiration. She's an OBE, by the way. Also, what I wanted to say, Denta, Midawa Sipa, for everything you're doing for the culture and the community. We're so proud of you. And the way that you're making it easier for diasporans to be able to come up and have a hybrid life in that they can still come and do something in Ghana, but effortlessly still be in the yeah, UK absolutely. and do both. And the way you, you and your family promote Ghana's rich history and culture, and the way that you are the ultimate connector. <laughs> Anybody that's coming to Ghana that wants to know how to settle, Odana Network yeah. is where you need to be. Absolutely. So well done. For Thank you, June. Network. Thank you so much. So that on that note, make sure that you visit us on the Guba Diaspora Network. Um, www.gubadiasporanetwork.com where we help diasporans transition or do business or visit. You know, we can help you as little as finding a caterer or a plumber yes. or a carpenter, you know, or getting your dual citizenship or your Ghana passport or your Ghana card. We help you open bank accounts. We help you even with everything. Even travel visa. Yeah, For even just, people. yeah, getting a visa or um, visa on arrival, we help you with everything. Because we know the struggles of a diaspora and trying to come back home when you don't have that much information. So please do subscribe to Adana Network and do visit the Guba Diaspora Network. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye.